It's what I used for the other videos from the last class. So not a webcam, but uh, just a camera camera. I just record the video straight and then, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, this, make sure I got the sound on. Yep. All right. Are you getting any value out of these? What's that? The Zooms? The Monday oh, night yeah. Zoom? Okay. Well, I missed last week just because I wasn't paying attention. I didn't see the post soon enough. Okay. And so I missed it, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I like to connect with everybody. All right. It's the closest we have to a classroom setting. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I heard we were going. But I, I think CBC is staying online through spring now. Through spring? Yeah, I've heard. No, that's what, Holy cow. That's what Kate told me, too. So the entire, pretty much the rest of uh, the rest of our program will be online. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, uh, it's good for me personally because my work schedule up through March wouldn't allow me to teach if we were doing the twice a week at the college. So I'd have to hand this off to somebody else. Uh, so at least online allows me to teach. Yeah, that's... That's the thing, though, is it really depends on who your teacher is for <laughs> online. So okay. I, I enjoy your class, and I feel like I get a lot from it, but oh, good. other teachers kind of just, I think, are taking it easy because it's online. I don't know. Yeah, that first one, uh, I found it very challenging to keep myself engaged uh, as much as I'm expecting you guys to be en engaged. So I... Doing those videos helped keep me spending, you know, 10, 15, 20 hours a week on the class, which is what I expect you guys to be doing. And it, I needed to be doing that too to be engaged. So, yes, yeah, some teachers are treating it like a paid vacation. Well, that's unfortunate. They just, they just put a bunch of crap on Canvas and walk away and just check on Canvas every once in a while. And it's, it's borderline fraudulent, in my opinion, but... I can see that. <laughs> if I didn't have a scholarship, I'd make a stink of it, but... Well, there's a lot of people paying out of their pocket, and a lot of people are frustrated with the, yeah, the level of engagement from some of these. When I went and got my master's degree, I did my master's degree online, and uh, I threw a stink on one class. There was one professor that was just, it was the, and it was the class that was the intro to my thesis project. And it was, she was only there to sell her book that she wrote, that she published through Amazon because nobody else would publish it. And that was it. Like every week was, and don't forget to check out my book. That was frustrating. So I understand. I've been there. I try not to do that to you guys. No, I mean, you're, I would say, one of the best as far as online instruction goes. Well, thank you. Yeah, honestly. Uh, you know, Craig, Craig was pretty good. I thought Craig was really good. You and then John was good. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Well, it looks like we got three of you. So... We're going to start. I got the... I got the camera. So this, so this is the image on my other camera watching us. Watching me watch you. I'll post that for everybody else. See how that works out. I don't know. Got to try something. Um, questions on the last two weeks. Let's clean up any of that stuff first, because some of you had some challenges on those quizzes. Uh, 
Any questions on the, the transformers, the buses, the flow of power? I saw more problems with that on the quizzes than I thought I would see. I had a question. Yep. Uh, I remember on, on one question, I forgot which one it was, I don't know if the test pulled up, but it was about, I was asking which, which, uh, which uh, buses I think were from e, 1E, and I put, it was SL1, SL2, and SL3, and I put SL3, 4, and 7, S1, I mean, S1. S1, 7, S1, 3, and S1, 4. Yeah. You said those were, they were non-class, is that why? Yeah, so the um, only, the only 125 volt DC buses that are 1E, that are safety related, are the ones that come off of SM7 and SM8 through the critical uh, SLs and SM buses, and that's the S1, 1 alpha, uh, S1, or S, yeah, S1, 2 alpha, and the S1 hipkus. Those are the only three 125 volt DC. I saw three people add more than just those. They were just kind of shotgun it with all the 1E stuff. Um, but I didn't ask for the 250 volt or the 24 volt DC 1E stuff, just the 125 volt. And then the, anything that comes off of SH5 or SH6, that's all non 1E, okay. non safety related, because it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, RHR, the residual heat removal, uh, low pressure core spray system, uh, service water, any of those critical systems that we have to have to make sure that we don't have a, an accident released to the public. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So it's just, it's just for the safety ones, like just the main important ones. Much. Yep. Jeffrey, Rick, do you guys have any questions from the quiz from last week, last two weeks? Um, I don't have a question from the quiz, but I do have a question from your example questions. Okay. Uh, it was, okay, so it reads as such. During a plant startup at about 25% power, an operator is performing a manual transfer of the startup power to normal power on non-critical buses SM1, 2, 3, and SH5 and 6. What is the startup power source? Um, because it because it says it's at about twenty five percent power, it was kind of gray to me because I wanted to say ash, but because it was a. Are you there? Yep, I'm just uh, loading up my desktop. I want to bring up those example questions. So this is the one you're talking about here. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So because it said it says twenty five percent power, and then in the literature, you know, it, there's different transformer formers that are acting at different percentages of power. Yep. So I guess I'm going to tell you what I put down, but I I probably wrong because of the it seemed like fifteen percent power. Something different happened. There was different things happening at different percentages. And so I had ash for the startup power source. And then what is the normal power source being transferred to? I put the plant generator. Yep. And then what do electrical interlocks for these breakers ensure? I put prevent parallel operation of startup and normal sources. Yeah, that's all 100% correct. The startup power source. Uh, and we, we don't, yeah, so the startup power source is the startup transformer, which is TRS, which right. is powered from the ash substation. So you're correct. And then the normal power source. So when we start up the reactor, right, we're, we're shut down, we start pulling rods, the fissions start happening, the water starts heating up a little bit, uh, and this chain reaction starts building, right, and building on itself and building on itself until it's critical and where the neutron population at the end of every neutron life cycle is the same as at the start. Now everything's even. Then we pull rods just a little bit more and we start heating up the water, what we call the point of adding heat. 
that's where we start to heat the water up from about uh, it's usually 81 to 96 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. We start boiling and now we're producing steam. And then we have to take all that volume all the way through that phase change, right? So it stays at about the same temperature for a long time while it gets absorbs heat and goes through its phase change and starts boiling. And then uh, once we start generating that steam, the steam starts coming out of the reactor. So all this time, the generator is not spinning because the turbines aren't spinning, right? And so we have to be producing enough steam to be able to efficiently spin the turbine. We can't just start sending any steam to the turbine. That's why the 25% power is so important. So a lot of other things will happen all the way up to about 25% power, but at about 25% power, we're producing enough steam that we can start rolling the, that we've, we can roll the turbine. So we roll the turbine, get it up to speed, and the steam loads at 25%, or the steam produced at 25% power supports spinning the turbine to produce, you know, the full megawatts. And then we're producing that uh, amount of electricity. Well, it's got to go somewhere. So that's where we take and shift from the TRS, the startup transformer, to the uh, normal transformer. Right, we put all our plant loads on the N1 and N2 transformers. And then we also tie the generator to the grid and start supplying the grid through the main uh, transformer, TRM. So startup, yeah, TRS, the normal being transferred to is the normal transformers. I capitalize those as kind of a hint. And then uh, what do the electrical interlocks ensure? This is that whole paralleling thing we talked about uh, two weeks ago. Is yeah, we don't want to parallel these sources. It's bad to parallel AC sources. You can parallel DC sources ten ways to Sunday. Doesn't matter. DC sources don't care. But it's those alternating currents that can't be paralleled together. At least not for very long. So, though we have the electrical interlocks to make sure that it doesn't happen. So what we do is we have the breakers from the startup transformer. So like uh, uh, the S1 breaker, startup transformer to uh, SM1. And then we have the breaker from N1 to SM1, N11. So the interlock is when I take S1 to close, the N11 automatically trips open so that they're not paralleled. But it also ensures that for that fraction of a second, we maintain continuity of power. Make sense? Yep. Cool. Yeah, I just, you know, there was, in the, in the text, there was just a lot, it seemed like there was a lot going on with different percentage levels. Yeah, fair enough figure how to stop the share here okay good question Jeff you got any questions I can think of right now. okay no worries well let's start talking about main steam then um, hopefully you've all read the overview page it's kind of a hint of what to look for out of the student text right take a look at the component uh, any power does it? Are there any power supplies associated with that component? Are there any interlocks or trip features associated with that component? Um, yeah, what is it designed to do and why? Everything from our the and you'll see one thing to clarify: the flow element is also called a flow restrictor in a lot of places. Flow element and flow restrictor which is abbreviated, I think, on your drawing is FE, is, it's interchangeable. FE, flow element, flow restrictor, all the same thing. It's how we measure our steam flow th out of the reactor. And those flow elements, uh, let me s pull up the drawing here. 
those flow elements if I remember right your drawing just has one on there but I you need to know that there's more than one yeah so this shows the this FE this flow element right before the main steam isolation valve 22 alpha that's the the flow element um, and there's one of those on each of the steam lines but the, whoever it is that came up with this drawing just drew one to simplify the drawing. Does that make sense? Yep. And it's the same with these SRVs, right? We show all four main steam lines, but we're only showing one SRV, where in fact each of these steam lines has either four or five um, SRVs on each, on each steam line. Alpha has four SRVs up here, Bravo has five, Charlie has five, and Delta has four. And these safety relief valves relieve down here into the suppression volume, the big pool of water in the dry well, through this thing called a downcomer and a, and a quencher. We release steam, the steam, this excess pressure that we want to relieve to keep the reactor from being overpressurized. We release it underwater, right? Because steam, if you remember for back from thermo, steam takes up the volume of a thousand times its volume. That same mass takes up 1,000 times the volume as steam as it does as water. So we want to put that, if we, if we release that steam into the dry well as steam, it would just stay steam for a long time until the temperature dropped enough for it to start condensing on things. And then, but that pressure, that steam has pressure associated with it. And so the drywall would pressurize. And we don't want that. It doesn't have a very high internal pressure rating. So we released all of that steam from the SRVs down here through these downcomers to below the water surface. That way it's immediately quenched. And that way we're not pressurizing the drywall. I don't think I was answering a question with that. I just started talking about that. So, um, Yeah. Should we just work through this a little bit? How, Quit. how come you can't run that steam into the turbine some way? Well, it's assuming that there's a problem somewhere out here and either these MSIVs, the main steam isolation valves, have all closed or there's a line break somewhere. And so we've got to get that steam out to a safe place. So if, as long as these main steam isolation valves, these uh, 22 Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta and the 28 Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta valves are open, yeah, we'll send that steam to the turbine. But and in doing so, we wouldn't have an overpressure problem in the reactor. But if these eight valves, or four of those eight valves, go closed, now all that pressure is bottled up. And it takes the, the creation of the power and the pressure and the steam and the heat in the reactor uh, doesn't stop instantaneously. So it's going to build up pressure while these are closed, and that pressure has to go somewhere. Does that make sense? If yeah. we if we've yeah, sent it to the like a waste of steam. Yeah. It does, but what we care about on the reactor is inventory. Okay? And we have uh, these like our RHR system, residual heat removal system that circulates water through the core uh, to keep it cool and provide injection source. And it takes a suction from the suppression volume. So getting all that steam back into the suppression volume gives us our inventory of water to provide cooling to the reactor. So it's still being used. It's really not going to waste at all. You're just losing the heat. Yep. Which is what we want to do. <laughs> we want to get that, that reaction stopped. We want to get that heat uh, stopped. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I gotta reset my ca other camera here.
some reason it only records 20 like 29 minutes of video at a time so every 20 something minutes I gotta stop and restart the recording all right back to this good question on the why don't we send it to the turbines right we don't want 18 more pipes leaving the dry well and going all the way through the people space to the turbines when uh, we want to minimize that right so we keep it limited to just the four pipes um let's see so that's the flow element the flow restrictor uh, and then we have these isolation valves i wrote a lot about that on the uh, intro overview page and we have a set in the dry well in this hardened reinforced concrete structure that houses the reactor and our emergency cooling systems uh, if there's a leak in the reactor in our recirculation system or anything it's designed to be retained within the dry well and then if it escapes the dry well for some reason we have the reactor building and then uh, like these pipes here these four pipes and these steam line drains are all in the what we call the steam tunnel so it's a it's an isolated part of the reactor building that's even isolated from the rest of the reactor building and then eventually we still have to get it out to the turbine building into the turbines so eventually all those steam pipes go all the way out to this to the main turbine and then we have all these drains so your discussion post this week what I'm looking for there is think about thermodynamically what's going on. Think about, uh, when you answer those questions, think about the Molier diagram, right? In your head, if, or draw it out if you can, or remember it in your head, uh, those constant pressure lines, remember which way they go. Are they horizontal or vertical or slanted? Which way are they headed up? And how does pressure change? How does pressure and temperature change together? Because steam going through a pipe, for leave, once it leaves the reactor, it's going to lose energy for various reasons. So you should talk about what are those, what causes it to lose energy? What are the reasons it would lose energy? And what's happened thermodynamic, what's happening thermodynamically with that steam? To give you an example, our pressure up here in the head of the reactor, all the way up here in the steam dome is what we call it, we usually maintain it about 1,020 PSIG, 1,020 pounds per square inch gauge, right up here. Now the turbine, these pressure switches here, that the, well even this equalizing header here with the pressure transmitters on it, these, that uh, send the signal to DEH, the pressure that's sensed here with that same steam is only about 980 PSIG. So it loses 40 pounds along the way for, for the reasons you're gonna talk about. Am I making sense without giving the, completely giving you everything I want you to type? <laughs> Mm, what else? Yeah, a lot of steam drains. Uh, Rixie, our reactor core isolation cooling. So the steam comes off so that in the event we have a problem and all our MSIVs, main steam isolation valves, all eight of them go closed, all four inboard and all four outboard, we still have a source of steam because it taps off almost right off the reactor on the Bravo steam line. And our reactor core isolation cooling uh, pump is a steam driven pump so the steam goes through a turbine that spins a pump that provides makeup feed water and it takes a suction from the suppression volume and injects into the feed line into the reactor so it circulates water from down here back into the reactor to make sure that we're keeping the core covered and this system is so important, this RCIC, this RICSI system, is so incredibly important that it made, it was the difference, uh, well, let's have a better way to say this. So the plant I came from in Minnesota was a BWR 
uh, BWR3 uh, with a Mark I containment system. That's exactly the type of plants that Fukushima had. We were the exact same type of plant. They had a instead of the su big suppression volume and the you know a big pool at the bottom of the dry well, they had a torus, which was just a ring of water around in a big steel donut around the reactor. Um, and so some differences. This is a much bigger plant here, the one we're looking at, than the one that I came from and the what Fukushima was. But one of the differences between the monocello nuclear power plant, the BWR. Uh, three Mark I containment from the Fukushima is we had installed an upgrade to this RCIC system, this RICSI system, to be able to run it in the event of a loss of all power. Now normally you needed uh, 125 volt DC to run, the, and it didn't matter which one, as long as you had one division, you could run RCIC. You had some indications, you had power to the controller. And that's the big thing, is it's still a, an electrical, a DC-powered controller to control the flow. Well, Fukushima didn't install that upgrade, so on a complete loss of power, which is exactly what they suffered, that was their last resort fee injection system. And they weren't able to manually run it uh, without any power. So that's the that's the last of the last right there, Rixi. And it just uses whatever steam is in the reactor, as it's sitting there maybe overheating or whatever's going on. That steam gets piped off, spins a turbine, that turbine spins a pump, and that pump up, takes a suction from the suppression volume and injects water back into the reactor. Because by the time the water's down here in the suppression volume, it's cooled off quite a bit, and uh yeah, so we're sending nice, cool water back to the core and keeping things, trying to remove all that excess, all that decay heat. Did uh, Three Mile Island have that system? Three Mile Island was a different type of reactor completely. It was a what we call a pressurized water reactor, a PWR. So they had, their types of systems aren't really uh, like one for one Hey, let's talk about what this, this is the example there. Uh, they're completely different. For example, yeah, their steam from their reactor, uh, it doesn't leave the, the reactor. Like their reactor doesn't actually produce steam. Their reactor just has really, really hot water that gets cycled through steam generators. And then the steam generators have water that comes in and gets turned to steam in, a, in four separate things inside their containment structure. And so clean steam comes out. So in ours, all this steam here is potentially contaminated in this BWR, boiling water reactor, because we're actually sending water into the core, turning that same water into the steam and sending it out to our turbine and through our condensate, through the main condenser, back through the condensate system, the feed system, and then back into the reactor. And as long as it stays in that loop, everybody's, you know, happy. But a pressurized water reactor reduces that risk of sending all this contaminated steam uh, through the plant by just keeping it all in their containment structure. So they just have clean water going into a steam generator and clean steam coming out. So their injection systems look completely different because of that. But they did have uh, cooling. They did have uh, they did have makeup water. They did have cooling. They did have put it in a safe condition. Once they realized that it that what they were seeing weren't wasn't the indications they thought they saw. We talked to we a couple of the groups studied Three Mile Island in one of the other classes. Uh, so. I think everybody got a chance to read what would the misunderstanding there was, right? They, th it was a throttling problem. That whole thing on the Molier diagram, where we go through a um, a constant enthalpy process, where it's a horizontal process across that uh, the, below the saturation curve on the Molier diagram, and um, I could stop sharing this now, huh? It's a where there's that. It's a horizontal process all the way across. So wherever we start in below the saturation curve is a throttling problem. And 
pressure can look because uh, those constant pressure lines are running up there through there right so you can have a uh, pressure drop and not see the temperature change you expect that's why we so that's one of the reasons we teach fundamentals in nuclear power now is to understand that Mollier diagram and that two phase uh, whatever all that stuff that's going on below the saturation curve is because they thought that their SRV their safety relief valve had closed and it hadn't. It was still open. They were just, all that steam was coming out as a throttling problem. And they, they turned off their pumps. They stopped injecting water intentionally. They, they, really, they really screwed the pooch till somebody walked into the control room and says, well, you're not injecting. And then steered them straight. And then they got injection back. Anyway. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Are most BWRs like contaminated? Like everything, like the, like the steam line and everything, like pretty much. Oh yeah. Systems. Yeah, but they're not bad, right? We, uh, it's only bad if there's a fuel defect. So that always, that's what, one of the reasons we talk about the fuel pellet, the niobium coated zircaloy matrix fuel pellet within the helium gap, within the fuel rod, within the cladding, all those boundaries. The reason we talk about all those is because the as long as all that stays intact, the only real contamination we're getting is uh, any activated particles. You send uh, some microscopic piece of particle from a valve, right, that gets cycled, and some little piece of metal goes through that system. Uh, it becomes activated when it's bombarded with neutrons. So now it's radioactive. And so it's cycling through the system. And so we have some radioactive particles uh, that go through like that. And then radioactive gases. Uh, the decomposition, electrolytic decomposition of water produces uh, gas, uh, radioactive gases. A lot of gamma radiation. Um, but we have chemistry, we use chemistry to combat that. Uh, for example, we, the industry as a whole, started about 10 years ago, a horrifically expensive project, but they platinum plate a lot of components throughout the core. And what they found was the platinum plating reduces the nitrogen-16 released gamma radiation by as much as uh, 10 times less. So it's producing a lot less radiation. But the, the fundamental answer to your question is, yeah, that's still, there's still some level of radiation, there's still some level of contamination in that steam that's coming out of the reactor, that's going through the turbine, that's going through the feed system, the condensate system, the feed system, all those valves. And so, yeah, everything, there's a lot of uh, contaminated signs all throughout the reactor building and turbine building. Yep. Things change though when you shut the reactor down. That stops oh, yeah. the neutron radiation. It does, and it, we we're no longer putting steam. We're never no longer putting steam out into the people space. You know, through the turb through the steam line, main steam lines to the turbine. So there's no steam leaks. There's no you know small releases uh, like that. Yeah, because I I've worked an outage out there and. I remember there's places that we couldn't go while it was running and then once the reactor shut down there was a period of time you know and then they let craft go in and do their thing yep yep absolutely a lot of locked high radiation areas in fact you can go in the dry well when we're shut down after everything's yep. decayed away usually a couple days and then they uh, they de-inert it because we keep it full of nitrogen when we're at power so then we take all the nitrogen out and put oxygen back in put air back in and yeah that dry well is terrible <laughs> i've never actually been in it it's hot. but it's hotter than hell it's like 120 degrees in there and humid and humid <laughs> that's the worst kind of no 120 degrees it. Go in dry and you come out soaking wet from sweat. Yep. Yep. Um. 
Let's see. It's kind of a small system this week. I mean, it's... I got my notes sitting open here. You know, it's the four steam lines come out, goes to the turbine. That's the goal, right? We have a way to isolate it. So you have to pay attention to the logic with the main steam isolation valves. You have to... We're going to talk about why all the drains... Um, the turbine bypass valves, that's a big one to look at. Those are incredibly important. Sometimes the MSIVs stay open, but for, for some reason with the turbine trips offline. We have suddenly have somewhere we have to send all that steam. Because like you're saying, if we can, we want to send it through the steam lines to the, to the uh, turbine or through the steam lines to the condenser. The SRVs, the safety relief valves, only relieve to send it to the suppression pool when the MSIVs are closed, the main steam isolation valves are closed. But as long as they're open, we want to send as much out as we can. Use it. Because we have all those other things that we're using steam for, right? We're trying to maintain a vacuum in the main condenser. And that taps off uh, that line that comes down headed to the... Um, Oh, where'd I go? Steam jet air jetters, the, um, the the reheaters, the reactor feed pumps. We need we need steam to our reactor feed pumps, which comes off of that the the bypass valve steam line. So we we want steam that goes all to all these loads down here as much as possible. So as long as those isolation valves are open. But if the turbine's not accepting any steam. That's when those bypass valves open up and send all that steam straight to the condenser. Oh, what else? We monitor radiation levels in the steam lines. You're going you're to see that in the text. Uh, we have alarms and trips. And those, the power supply to those is Reactor Protection System, RPS power supply. Yeah. 